In Honduras, Xiomara Castro is scheduled to be sworn in as the first female president in a historic event attended by many world leaders who began arriving in the country on Wednesday. The United States has finally delivered its written response to Russia's security demands after a month of escalating tensions. The Ethiopian government announced on Wednesday it had decided to lift the six-month state of emergency ahead of its expiration amid an improving security situation. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, in this are the news. In Honduras, Xiomara Castro is scheduled to be sworn in as the first female president in a historic event attended by many world leaders who began arriving in the country on Wednesday. The leader of the Liberty and Refoundation Party and the people of Honduras will be accompanied by world leaders, such as the Vice President of Argentina, Cristina Fernandez, King Felipe VI of Spain, former presidents of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff and Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, Salvador Valdez Mesa, the Vice President of Cuba, Gabriel Boric, President-elect of Chile, Evo Morales, former President of Bolivia, Marcelo Ebrard, Foreign Minister of Mexico, and Kamala Harris, the Vice President of the United States, among other personalities and delegations. The event will be an opportunity to renew relations with many countries, establish contacts, and consolidate the alliances. Countries such as Venezuela, whose relationship with this Central American nation experienced its lowest hours during Juan Orlando Hernández's administration, will also attend this important event. The fall of the Berlin Wall makes some believe that history was over and that then there was no other option or model to carry forward than neoliberalism. However, the resistance of the peoples begins to emerge New leaderships, new movement, new political spaces begin to emerge because the characteristics of this is that the people always return in Latin America. It doesn't always have the same formal in all the decades and in all the stages. If it always has the same objective and then begins a virtuous process and a virtuous process that can be measured in what virtue must be measured in governance, which is to improve the quality of life of people. Meanwhile, Cristina Fernandez denounced the application of judicial coups in Latin America as a new form of interference and in place of the military coups implemented at the end of the 20th century. In this decade of beginning in the late 20th and early 21st century, there are also setbacks in the peoples, no longer in the form of what the military coups have been. It is no longer necessary now it is no longer necessary to bring the military to educate them in Panama in the School of the Americas. Now we must get judges who are educated in commissions, in forums that always finance in the same way that military coups were financed. Begin to finance judicial coups also in Latin America in the same way and with the same financiers. We now move on to Argentina, where the government expects to reach an agreement with the International Monetary Fund this week, ahead of a Friday deadline for a payment of more than $700 million. Following the extended efforts, President Alberto Fernandez expects the IMF to inform that it accepts the economic program proposed by Argentina, clearing the way for a renegotiation of the record debt agreed by the previous administration of Mauricio Macri in 2018. The government noted that political negotiations with the U.S. government and a better understanding between the team headed by Economy Minister Martin Guzman and the firm's technicians on the fine print had allowed to overcome the obstacles that had kept the negotiations on hold. The Fernandez government has repeatedly stressed it will not accept an agreement that implies structural adjustment or puts a break on economic growth. Now we address other topics. The director of the Pan American Health Organization warned on Wednesday that there has been a 32 increase percent, percent increase, I beg your pardon, in COVID-19 cases reported in the Americas in the past week.
During an online conference with regional officials, the PAHO director Carissa Etienne stated that Omicron has become the dominant COVID-19 strain in the region. She also warned that there could be outbreaks of other diseases because fewer children are getting routine vaccinations against things like measles due to the pressure of health clinics, citing an outbreak of measles in Brazil and diphtheria outbreak in Dominican Republic. Last week, more than 8 million new COVID-19 cases were reported in our region. This is the highest number of weekly cases since the pandemic started, and it is 32% higher than the previous week. COVID cases are spreading more actively and more quickly than ever before. It is clear that Omicron has become the predominant SARS-CoV-2 strain in our region at this moment. Nigeria has launched a new coronavirus vaccination drive as the Omicron variant spreads. Authorities in the capital launched a new campaign using mobile vaccination units in order to reach more people. Trucks with banners and speakers announcing that the vaccination is free and safe are being deployed across markets in the capital Abuja, followed by the health workers in Wans ready to administer the shots. Health officials have set an ambitious goal of vaccinating more than a quarter of the population by February. While vaccine hesitancy has been high, the country's vaccination rate has nearly doubled over the past few weeks. Denmark's government has announced it will be removing all remaining coronavirus measures from February 1st. Prime Minister Matt Frederiksen addressed the nation saying Denmark will be completely open again and that while the pandemic continues, the government believes the country has overcome the critical phase of the outbreak. It was not clear what restrictions will end, but they will likely include the digital health pass, which is currently required to enter museums, nightclubs, cafes and to visit indoors and restaurants. People age over 15 must also flash the pass when attending outdoor events where the capacity exceeds 2,000. Good evening and welcome. We have held 26 news conferences about coronavirus here in Spenhelsalen, and it can be difficult to distinguish them from each other. But common to most has been that we have spoken with serious tone and delivered difficult messages. Tonight we can start lowering our shoulders and start finding the right smile again. For tonight and today, it is a milestone. We are here with the incredible good news we can now remove the last coronavirus restrictions in Denmark. From February the 1st, in only a few days, Denmark will be open again, completely open. It marks a transition to a new time for all of us. During the pandemic, our patience and our perseverance and our unity as Danish has been tested. And today we can say that we have passed the test. We are ready to step out of the shadow of coronavirus. We say goodbye to the restrictions and welcome to the life we knew before coronavirus. The pandemic is still here, but with what we know now, we who stand here are there to believe that we are through the critical phase. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back. The United States has finally delivered its written response to Russia's security demands after a month of escalating tensions. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken announced on Wednesday that Washington has set out a serious diplomatic path to resolve the conflict over Ukraine, but stressed that the ball was in Russia's court. The press conference offered little details on the response, but Blinken stressed that the U.S. position remained the same. He also reiterated the U.S. commitment to an open-doors policy regarding the North Atlantic Treaty Organization alliance, that in hopes of a guarantee of Russia's demands that Ukraine will not be allowed to join the military alliance.
The Russian Foreign Ministry confirmed on Wednesday that the United States has delivered a much-awaited written response to Moscow's security demands on Ukraine and NATO expansion. The ministry said U.S. Ambassador to Moscow John Sullivan handed over the response to Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Alexander Groshko. The U.S. hasn't made its response public, but has stressed that Russia's top demands are unacceptable. Amid a major propaganda campaign and military deployment in neighboring Ukraine, as the West falsely accuses Russia of planning an invasion, Moscow has demanded guarantees that NATO will never admit Ukraine or any other former Soviet nations as members, and that the alliance will roll back its military and of Russia. Meanwhile, the U.S. continues to send military equipment and weapons to Ukraine and has signaled the possible deployment of 8,500 troops. In another bid to defuse tensions, envoys from Russia, Ukraine, France and Germany met on Wednesday for more than five hours in Paris to discuss the separatist conflict in Ukraine. Russia's representative noted that there was no breakthrough and the so-called Normandy former talks, but that participants have promised to meet for new talks in two weeks in Berlin. France and Germany have joined the United States in warning Russia against a supposed invasion of Ukraine, something Moscow has repeatedly dismissed but have been less direct about sanctions. Germany's new coalition government has sent mixed signals on whether it will serve to soon to open Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Russia, which will circumvent Ukraine to provide gas to Europe's largest economy. Meanwhile, the United States continue to issue threats. Our talks were not simple, but they were perhaps the first frank talks in order to do an inventory of all the problems related to the implementation of the MIX agreement. We agree that despite all the difference in interpretation of the MIX agreement that exists between Ukraine and representative of certain regions of the domestic and Lugansk regions, the cease of fire must be accepted unconditionally, and the agreement that was signed on July 22, 2020 must be implemented by both parties. Our colleagues agreed that it is still necessary to take a break, to think and come out to discuss and resolve all those contradictions that exist today. And unfortunately, there are quite a few of them. Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa al kadimi made a rare visit to the border with Syria on Wednesday to express support for troops and boost morale. The visit came in the midst of an escalation by attack by the Islamic State groups, which have affected both Iraq and neighboring Syria, leading to fears that the terrorists are gaining ground as they exploit a security vacuum in the countries in the north perpetuated by the territorial disputes. Meanwhile, Syria has denounced that illegal United States occupation troops are aiding the terrorist groups in their bid to overthrow the Syrian government and continue stealing the country's resources. And the critical humanitarian situation is escalating in the northeastern province of Syria of Hazakeh, where the fifth consecutive day, thousands of families continue to be displaced as a result of the attacks by Daesh terrorists and air bombardments by the U.S. occupation forces, and also their separatist militia, the so-called Syrian Democratic Forces. Our correspondent, Hisham Wanus, has the details. More than 3,900 families had to leave their homes in the southern neighborhoods of Hasakek and went to temporary lodging centers in government control areas through the corridors set up by the Syrian army. A critical humanitarian situation amidst harsh weather conditions, which prompted Damascus to urge UN organizations and other international humanitarian agencies to take all measures to provide assistance to these distressed families. The situation is difficult because due to the bombings, the attacks and the destruction, we have to flee our homes only with our clothes and to save our children and our life. And here we are in a shelter where we receive the support of the authorities within their means and yet the assistance is not enough and we do not know what to do or where to go. Despite the total absence of international humanitarian and relief organizations, the Syrian authorities, in cooperation with the Syrian Red Crescent and some charity organizations, have continued to provide assistance to displaced families in Hasakek, a work that Damascus denounces clashes against coercive measures imposed on Syria by countries that claim to defend human rights. The chaos is spread in our neighborhood due to the air bombings and attacks by the armed forces, and we were forced to flee and come to this place where the aid is not enough and does not reach all the displaced people because there are not enough kills, not enough food, 
not enough space, and we do not know where we can go. In the meantime, Damascus denounces that, under the pretext of pursuing escaped terrorists from a prison under the control of pro-U.S. separatist militias, Washington is continuing its air bombardment of northeastern Syria in a new attempt to recycle the Daesh terrorist entity to justify its legal military presence on Syrian soil. Thank you, Hisham, for this report, and we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. The Ethiopian government announced on Wednesday it had decided to end the six-month state of emergency decreed in November ahead of its expiration amid an improving security situation. The decision came in an extraordinary session of the Council of Ministers and is pending endorsement by the lower house of parliament, according to a statement issued by the prime minister's office. The government declared the state of emergency in early November to curtail the advancement of forces of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, as they appeared close to reaching the capital. Over the past month, the Ethiopian National Defense Forces have managed to push back forces loyal to the rebel TPLF back to the northern Tigray region, where the conflict broke out in 2020. And the massacre in Yemen continues. The Saudi-led coalition launched a full out of offensive against the capital Zena and its surroundings. On Tuesday night, the coalition led by Saudi Arabia carried out over 20 airstrikes on Yemen's capital, targeting the international airport and the old Al-Lami Air Base. The conflict has escalated over the past two weeks as the Huri movement has also launched attacks on the United Arab Emirates, part of the intervening coalition which has been bombarding parts of the country for weeks. The conflict has killed tens of thousands of civilians and fighters in Yemen and created the world's biggest humanitarian disaster in the Arab world's poorest country. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres told the Security Council on Wednesday that Afghanistan is hanged in by a threat. The UN chief called for countries to authorize all transactions needed to carry out humanitarian activities in the country. He also pushed for a suspension of any rules of conditions restricting life-saving and operations, as millions suffer extreme hunger. Some $9.5 billion in Afghan central bank reserves remain blocked abroad, and international aid has dried up since the Taliban returned to power in August, as donors seek to use the money as leverage over the Taliban while ignoring the plight of a population. The United Nations earlier this month appealed for $4.4 billion in humanitarian aid for Afghanistan in 2022 and on Wednesday said it needed a further $3.6 billion. We need to suspend the rules and conditions that constrict not only Afghanistan's economy but our life-saving operations. At this moment of maximum need, these rules must be seriously reviewed. International funding must be allowed to pay the salaries of public sector workers. From surgeons and nurses to teachers, sanitation workers and electricians, all are vital to keeping systems up and running, and they are critical to Afghanistan's future. We need to give them a reason to stay in the country. Time is of the essence. Without action, lives will be lost, and despair and extremism will grow. A collapse of the Afghan economy could lead to a massive exodus of people fleeing the country. As a moral imperative and a practical one, all doors must be kept open for women and girls, in schools, in the workplace, in the halls of justice, and across all aspects of public life. Opportunities for a new beginning are rare. We urge the Taliban to seize this moment and garner international trust and goodwill by recognizing and upholding the basic human rights that belong to every girl and woman. Now we move on to other topics. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang held a virtual meeting with Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte on Wednesday as the two discussed their bilateral relations. Both sides called to strengthen exchanges and cooperation, 
Lee said China is willing to work with the Netherlands to strengthen political mutual trust, advance practical cooperation, enhance people-to-people -people exchanges, and push for new development in bilateral relations so as to better benefit the two countries and their two peoples. Meanwhile, the Dutch Prime Minister noted that the European Union and China needed to strengthen dialogue and work together to properly handle their differences, while jointly addressing global challenges such as the pandemic and climate change. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi reiterated that the United States must lift unilateral sanctions against his country as a preliminary step to establishing a dialogue on the nuclear agreement. In statements to the press, the Iranian president pointed out that only if the other side is ready to lift the oppressive sanctions against the Iranian people will there be a possibility of reactivating the nuclear deal signed in 2015. Meanwhile, spokesperson for the U.S. State Department, Ned Price, indicated that the U.S. is willing to hold direct bilateral and multilateral talks with Iran to quickly reach an understanding for a return to compliance with the nuclear agreement. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.